So my name is Amanda Rosenzweig. I am the Assistant Dean of the School of STEM, and we appreciate everyone joining the Science Laboratory Technology Virtual Open House for the 2024 year. We have a great group of individuals joining us to share about their career paths and um, job opportunities and um, a day in their life within their industry. Before we get started, I'm just gonna do a little um, housekeeping and discuss the program. And then our directors will make sure that they give you a great introduction and then we'll get the, um, the members of our community to share their interests. So just know that you can chat to introduce yourself and feel free to leave questions in the chat. After each speaker, the speakers will be leaving a few minutes to answer any questions. If you are not speaking, please remain on mute. And then if you have a specific question you wanna ask or you have some information to share, please raise your hand. And closed captionings are available. If you do not want to see them, you can turn them off in the Zoom toolbar. So if you want to learn a little bit about our program, we have a QR code that you can scan with your phone and it will take you to the SLT, Science Lab Techs website, where you can see the curriculum and other information um, about the program. And I'll leave it on here for just a second in case anyone wants to scan it. Also, if you want a copy of today's presentation, you can grab your phone again and scan this QR code. The presentation not only contains information about the program, information about the speakers today, but also you will get an introduction to the faculty as well as some of our students and their success stories. In addition, we are pretty um, active on social media, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And we have been fortunate to be spotlighted in different news programs. So all this information will be available on the presentation. And our contact information for the different programs with SLT are below. And one thing that we do is any student that is interested, feel free to reach out to um, Dr. Noble, myself, Dr. Rosenzweig, or Ms. Shunick, and we are happy to discuss the program with you as well as create you a academic path so you understand what your options are moving through the course curriculum. And everyone that is joining now, we appreciate you coming in. And this is being recorded, so all the information um, can be watched at a future date. So just a little bit about the SLT program. Um, this program, SLT, is gonna be broken into two concentrations, biotechnology and chemical technology and it provides students with the necessary skills and techniques for standard everyday science lab work. Um, the students are able to explore the curriculum and are exposed to a variety of lab testing techniques, and they're able to prepare and, um, themselves and operate various types of tools, uh, electronic analysis equipment, and they're also exposed to a variety of industry information. Uh, the SLT program does prepare graduates for employment in chemical, biological, and associated science laboratories, 
And we also have water and wastewater treatment production and distribution um, certificates aligned with it. So to enter the SLT program, there it is an open admissions program, but you do have to have a few courses uh, completed before moving into the introductory courses. And these are gonna be your general biology lecture and lab, your general chemistry lecture and lab, a math course and an English course. So about one semester's full um, of curriculum prior to entering the core classes and introductory classes for SLT. Um, just to give you some background on our faculty, there's much more information on them throughout this presentation that I will share in the chat also if you weren't able to scan the code. But we do a lot of research with um, algae, and we have a lot of small grants that support some of this research, one being with SBI. We are incorporating bioindustrial manufacturing practices in the fall 2025 via an NSF ATE grant. We do have an ARISE grant via the USDA, um, led by Dr. Nesbitt and that is being held on campus as well as at the USDA. And our BSL2 lab will be opening very soon. We're going through the final certification steps. And we are a partner with the Dow Internship Program. So we just have a lot of um, information per, um, that exposes students to different opportunities. And our faculty are also currently being trained in different um, aspects of the industry. They travel each summer. Um, something that's not on here is we also have a forensics aspect to this program with Ms. Shunick, and she also travels um, every summer to be trained in different techniques. Lots of partners support our program. Um, these are mostly our local partners. So we have great relationships with our local partners, um, giving our students a lot of different exposure to uh, different industries. And then we also have relationship with a lot of national engagement from ATEC to CMAT to Biomaid. Um, and we're on a lot of advisory boards that work with uh, policies for biotechnology and chemical technology education and um, industry regulations. This is just where some of our students are now that have graduated. Um, we have a lot of students that go um, and further their education at UNO, Tulane, LSU. And these students also usually work part-time in the field. So our students have 100% placement, which we're very proud of. And again, many of them move on to further their education and get a, um, a, a degree. We've had a lot of growth since the program started. Um, we The program was initiated in 2015 and the team that we currently have now took over in 2019. So we have seen a lot of growth in the program as well as in faculty enhancements. So I am going to pass it over to the heart of the program, the two directors of biotechnology and chemical technology. Ms. Um, Charlene Shunick and Dr. April Noble. Hey everybody, my name is Charlie Shunick and I'm the Biotechnology Director. I've been in this position since 2019 and uh, it's really fun. We develop new courses all the time. My primary uh, role with this program is to make sure that students are happy and successful and to ensure that we are training our students with the standard um, skill sets that they need to be successful in their next program or in their career. And our students have been really successful. They've been getting into their programs. They've been getting hired, making more money than we do sometimes. So it's been really fun. And uh, I'm really proud of the staff that we have. So yeah, if anyone has any questions about the biotechnology concentration, I'm your girl. 
And uh, my contact information is in here. Just let me know if y'all have any questions. And we are developing more forensic science courses now as well that transfer right over to SUNO. And they are mostly natural science electives that transfer to many other colleges and programs. So, you know, there's, there's several options that we offer to you guys. Hi, I am Dr. Noble. So I am the chemical technology partner with Ms. Shunick. And so primary goals are still the same, working with students to you know, make sure they develop all the skills that they're needed, but as well as working with our community partners to identify those skills so that we can make sure that we're on the same page. So I am... Um, the instructor for the SLT courses for chemical technology in terms of instrumental, analytical, and advanced chemistry courses. April, since you are our representative for Dow, would you talk about the program with the students for just a quick minute? Yes, so we have, um, Oh, about three or four students that are coming in from Dow. So Dow is one of the partners that we work with and we do an internship with them in which Dow pays for them to be students and do coursework, study, homework, come to class. And they only have to work two days a week. I can't remember off the top of my head the number of hours, but they work two days a week. And then the other days is just dedicated to school. So we have been getting a lot of students from Dow. Um, we have one that will be coming in who switched from being in the field to going into the laboratory. And so for their laboratory positions, they need 20 to 25 hours of chemistry. So our goal is to service our community partners and ensure that their employees and our students uh, meet the needs of those community partners. And also Dr. Noble is our water and wastewater tech uh, a lead. And if you don't mind mentioning some of the information about that and the programs that are running this summer for the students that are listening in. Yes, so we do water and wastewater technology. We have a certification um, exam, well, the state has a certification exam that those operators would take, and they would be water treatment, water production, water distribution, wastewater collection, and wastewater treatment. So currently we're running four courses, a level one, a level two, a level three, and a level four for water treatment. And we've partnered with the Sewage and Water Board. We've also worked with Kenner and Gretna, and we hope to expand more with them. But we're working more with the sewage and water board. So our courses are held on site at their Carrollton facility. Um, so we have a lot of students that have been promoted and they would get a technical certificate for taking two courses, two water courses. So a level one, level two, or a level two, level three in their area. In the summer, we have two to four water production courses that we're going to be putting online. And again, still partnered with the sewage and water board, but anybody has the ability to uh, enroll in those courses. So it's not just those utilities, um, anybody, the community, the public, and we have one student that came in through Goodwill. So he's currently employed with the sewage and water board and should be applying to get his level one license in water treatment. Thank you so much, Dr. Noble. I will be sharing Dr. Noble's and Ms. Shunick's information in the chat. Also, I left my information in the chat um, for anyone that would like to reach out and learn more information about the programs or just have access to the recording once it is encoded and published. So this moves us forward to um, the actual presentations beginning. So what to expect from today is these presenters are just going to talk about their background, the types of research, any future plans and goals that they have within their industry, 
um, a typical day in their life, as well as if there are any potential internships and hiring opportunities in the future and what they look for. Um, feel free to leave questions in the chat. We'll make sure that the um, presenters are asked that towards the end of their presentation. And um, we are excited to get started today. The presenters will be taking control of the screen to share. And then um, Ms. Shunick will be doing all the introductions. So I'm going to stop sharing um, in just a second. This is a brief overview of today's presentations. And um, each presenter has 20 minutes, and they're going to leave a few minutes at the end to make sure that they uh, can answer any questions that you have. Okay, everybody, welcome. So again, I'm Charlie Shunick, and our first speaker is someone that we work with closely at UNO, Dr. Wendy Schlechter, a Eurofins professor of microbiology and the chair of Department of Biological Sciences. So uh, go ahead, Dr. Schlechter, thank you. Great, thank you very much. So, um, hopefully you guys can see my screen now. Great. So um, one of the um, things that I really enjoy as a faculty member at UNO is um, actually interacting with students um, in my research lab. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit today about sort of the history of my interactions with undergrads and then a little bit about my research and maybe a little bit about how I got to where I am. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So. Um, one of the things that I think really sets UNO apart um, from other four-year schools is really the length and um, importance that we uh, put on our undergraduate students getting involved in research. Um, and in many cases, that's either for earning credits um, and or also getting paid. And um, I think that's a real uh, plus, because almost all of our students um, have to work, and my screen sometimes freezes up, but hopefully you guys still see me. <laughs> um, and so um, I started at UNO in 1998 and um, as an assistant professor, and uh, my path to get there was really as an undergrad, I thought I wanted to go to vet school. And so I was really interested in biology and animals. And it was really doing an internship in a vet clinic that showed me that that wasn't the path for me. <laughs> so I always encourage students to try things because that's how you learn whether you, um, whether you like them or not. And so um, what it told me was I really still like biology, but, um, but vet school was probably not the best path for me. And it was really getting involved as an undergrad um, in research, a research lab that really changed my trajectory and opened my eyes to the possibility that I could do research for a career. And that was not something that I knew anything about as an undergrad before then. And so um, I went to graduate school um, at Penn State and got a PhD um, and then did a, a kind of a postdoctoral research uh, stint at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and that's kind of like doctors do a residency. It's sort of the same thing for researchers. We sort of, you know, hone our skills a little bit more, get more independent experience, and then, you know, you go look for a job. And people with a PhD can get jobs in, in academia or in um, government or in um, industry. And so there's many options, um, but I always liked interacting with students. And so, um, so that's why I ended up at um, getting a job at UNO. It's sort of a half-time research, half-time teaching job for me. Um, and so I've always had graduate students and undergraduate students in the lab. So since I started in 1998, um, I've mentored over 120 um, undergraduates in research projects. Um, and those that tend to stay in my lab for more than a year are very likely to be co-authors on publications. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a couple of them. 
Um, I get grants, I write grants to um, federal and state agencies to get support for research. And we also support education initiatives at UNO because I'm department chair also. So that's something that we do. Um, and almost all of the students that work in my lab um, are paid. A few of them do it for credit, but um, but I also understand that students need to earn money and I'd rather that they do it while they're on campus and actually use the information that they're learning in classes. Okay. So I study cyanobacteria and these culture flasks you see over here are all different cultures of marine um, cyanobacteria that are very ubiquitous in the ocean, very important in the nutrient cycle. But the only real difference is the pigments that they make for their light harvesting. And you really see that visually, right? Um, the, the pigmentation changes a lot based on this massive protein complex that they make called the phycobilisome. And this purpose of this is just like we think of as an antenna, right? that you are harvesting something. In this case, we're talking about light energy and you're transferring that light energy to reaction centers in the thylakoid membrane to do photosynthesis. And so organisms in the ocean, depending on where they are in the water column, are gonna experience different colors of light because the ocean is gonna filter it. And you've, if you've ever gone scuba diving, you sort of know this, right? That in certain waters, the water appears different colors depending on where you are in the water column. And that's because there are things in the, in the ocean that filter light. And so organisms that can um, respond to that light and make the best pigments to absorb the light they're experiencing are gonna be the most successful. And so what I study is a process called chromatic acclimation which is how these organisms, well, a subset of these organisms have the ability to change the pigmentation in their phycobilisome to best absorb the light they're experiencing. And so um, this is an example up here. You see, this is the same organism. This one was grown in green light. This one was grown in blue light. And so you can see the pigmentation of the organism looks different, right? And it's because they're making some of the proteins that are in this phycobilisome, they're actually putting a different pigment on them. The pigment um, is related to heme. If you, if you know about red blood cells and hemoglobin, heme is the pigment on, on um, hemoglobin. And these organisms take heme and modify it a little bit um, chemically and um, make different pigments. And we study the process of how the enzymes that attach the pigment and the, there's a group of enzymes that also attach and isomerize the pigment so that it absorbs a different light um, uh, wavelength. And this process of chromatic acclimation is very important um, in the ocean and its ecosystem. And so it has a broad um, importance globally. Um, and just interestingly, the ability to do this is because, for those of you that had microbiology, um, is because they've acquired this little piece of DNA, probably from a virus, that brought in this little segment of DNA that allows them to undergo this process of chromatic acclimation. So the difference between organisms that can, can chromatically acclimate and those that can't is this little 5,000 base pair piece of DNA that was introduced probably by a virus. And just a few subset of genes allow them to do this. And so um, we study the process, we study bio, the biochemical process. So my lab sort of does a lot of molecular biology, biochemistry, and my students learn all of those techniques. I wanna make sure I'm, I'm honoring time here. Um, so I involve undergraduates because I think it increases their retention. They enjoy learning and applying what they know. They contribute to the, my research and they really connect with what they learn in the classroom with real world problem solving, which I really enjoy. Also, I think it's important for undergrads to have a home base while they're at UNO. So you're taking classes, but in between classes, you can come to my lab, you have a place to plop your you know, to eat lunch, to plop your uh, backpack. Um, and 
we work on a public speaking skill. So we have lab meetings where you practice talking about research, which I think is really important. And you learn skills that enable you to get jobs. So you're also much more competitive for graduate school. Some of you may not have thought about graduate school, but it's actually a pretty good deal in science. Generally, if you're if you earn good grades and you get experience in research and you figure that's something you might want to do, you should ask people about it because most graduate programs will pay you to go to school. Um, at least they'll pay your tuition and they'll give you a stipend. Um, it's not a lot of money, but you're not having to take out loans to go to graduate school. And that's kind of a hidden little hidden secret that's out there, which is a big advantage to graduate school versus potentially going to medical school where you're gonna go into a huge amount of debt. Um, but also those interested in medical and dental school research can actually be the thing that sets you apart from some other candidate. So I would consider, you know, anybody that's considering all those options, I think it's just a great way to enhance your skills. Um, at UNO, we have several ways that we can um, support students that are interested in doing research. We have um, this program called Pursue, which students apply for um, in, in the fall semester, usually September, October, and then they find out if they're accepted into the program. And then in the spring, they work with a faculty member in a research lab and make about $15 an hour. So it's you're not gonna get rich doing this, but it's definitely um, better than, you know, sort of getting a job flipping burgers because you're, you're kind of doing something that's really you're interested in um, and really working on a great letter of recommendation for any potential thing you wanna do next. Um, and I think that's really uh, valuable. We also have the College of Sciences also has an undergraduate research program, kind of works the same way. And we've now streamlined the application. So you apply to one program and several of them might, might fund you. Um, we've had various um, biology majors uh, do various things. And I just wanted to maybe talk a little bit about what they've done. So this undergraduate student, um, you know, worked in a lab uh, studying butterfly ecology on a grant that I was involved in and ended up using that um, program. She got to go to Costa Rica and, you know, run around and catch butterflies and see this beautiful area. Get She got a, uh, she was a co-author on a research paper and she got into her medical school, which is the University of Mississippi Medical School, and is, she's now a practicing physician. So, you know, you would never thought that butterfly ecology would be directly connected to medical school, but for her it was. And so it's really about um, expanding your skill set and gives you more confidence, I think, to do anything you want to do. Um, a lot of my undergraduates have gone on to do big and wonderful things. Um, Alan Williams, uh, this was taken a long time ago. This picture was taken a long time ago. I look a lot younger in this picture. <laughs> um, but these are graduate students, at the, all, all my graduate and undergraduate students at the time. And this undergraduate student went on to um, get a PhD in immunology at Yale. Um, and then um, Yasmin uh, was an undergraduate student in my lab for three or four years. And she got her PhD at Baylor. And now she's... Um, uh, doing research um, at the University of California at San Diego, I think, as um, a postdoc. Um, she's moved on since since I actually did this. So um, these are the proteins that I study, and they're very beautiful in color. So I really enjoy um, working with these beautiful colored proteins. Um, a couple of other undergrads that have gone on to do really great things. Uh, Jacob Frick was an undergrad in my lab for four years, um, and now he's almost done with his PhD in microbiology at the University of Washington Medical School. He was a co-author on four publications with me, um, and I had no doubt, not one doubt, that he was going to be successful in graduate school because he really had uh, that knack. Um, and uh, Suman uh, Pokro, uh, just graduated with his PhD at, from Stanford and is uh, going on to do a postdoc now. Um, but he had three, three publications with me as an undergrad. And um, Bikram is um, graduated in um, 2017. And now he just graduated from a PhD program at Colorado School of Mining. And then Kesslyn Joseph, who started with me as an undergrad, 
um, just finished her PhD um, this past year and is looking, she's it's a postdoc with me right now and she's looking for another job uh, right as we speak. So, you know, these students have really gained the skills and the confidence to do things that they wanna do. So uh, whether that's medical school, whether that's graduate school, whether that's just a direct job, because several of my students you know, are now working out at the Oshner um, Research Foundation, for example, is one example. One is a two-lane uh, doing um, animal research there. So these are my undergrads that got to go to this um, national conference um, in Chicago, and they were the only undergrads there at the conference. Um, and we we really try to engage our students at UNO um, through various ways, um, we try to engage them with giving back to the community. So we do activities with the Girl Scouts, for example, um, and programs with them, because I think that's a way for our, our students to really realize that they can really make an impact on others. And I think that's really important too. Uh, many of my students, of our students, you know, our best students are selected for awards. Um, and they can do other things. For example, we have programs with Oshner and with the University of Massachusetts Medical School um, to engage our students in the summer to do research. Um, so they get to experience not just research at UNO, but other places as well. And I think that's a real, the diversity of experience is really important to help you choose the best career path for you. Um, the University of Mass Massachusetts Medical School program um, we had one of our alumni um, who graduated from UNO, went on to medical school at LSU Medical Center, got his medical degree, and then got involved in a research career after he got his medical degree and had various, various uh, success in, in medical research. But he's now the dean, I'm sorry, he's now the provost of the medical school at the University of Massachusetts. And personally, he gives money to fund UNO students, two, up to two UNO students to go to their program, like it, out of his pocket every year because he values the education he had at UNO. And he feels very strongly about undergraduates getting that research experience as, as um, undergrads to help um, medical research succeed. So that biomedical research is really critical. And going to medical school is a great way to contribute, but getting your PhD or your MD and doing that biomedical research can solve real problems in the world. So he, that's a great program that we have. And so with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing and see if there are any questions. Wendy, do you mind speaking just a little bit to the students about our work as what we're moving forward with with transferring from VCC to UNO, our new grants? Yeah, yeah, that's exciting. Um, Amanda and I and um, Dr. Horn at UNO um, were, were working hard this past summer and fall to write this grant because we felt like um, a lot of students start off at a community college and don't necessarily know the path they're going to take. And so they take courses that may not transfer well. And so we really wanted to align our course, align UNO and Delgado's coursework at the under at the early undergraduate stage, like the the early biology, freshman biology courses that they we might take. Um, and make sure that they're that uh, students at Delgado are learning the same skills at UNO. So those that transfer are going to have a seamless experience that the credits that they take at Delgado are going to very easily transfer to UNO without it. You know, they'll understand exactly how that process works um, and that the the labs that they take at Delgado are going to be very similar to the ones that we offer at UNO. So the students are going to be just like really well prepared to walk into a four year degree and a research lab because frankly um, you're going to learn like PCR and some other important skills in the in, even in the that first freshman course which I think is going to give you an advantage in the SLT program because you're, that's going to be like um, getting more and more experience and, and multiple levels of experience at these ty types of techniques that are really critical in research labs. So 
um, polymerase chain reaction is how we amplify DNA. And um, it's used in almost every field of biochemistry, um, molecular biology sort of research, even ecology research uses PCR all the time. So it's one of those critical skills that if you can say you know how to set up PCR, probably you're gonna be able to get a job um, even with the two year degree. So I think, you know, we underestimate those skills and, and how I think just getting many multiple levels of experience with these things can really help in success. So, um, so this grant that we got it sort of um, is going to make the experience seamless going from Delgado to UNO for biology and also uh, make a transfer portal where you can type in any course that you're taking at Delgado and see exactly how that's going to transfer, exactly how it will count for a degree at UNO. So I think that's going to the information that's going to give you guys um, sort of a um, confidence that what you're taking at Delgado will serve you well in a four year degree and exactly how it'll count. Thank you so much for joining us today. Sure. I didn't see any questions in the chat. Does anyone have anything they would like to ask before we transition to our next speaker? Well, if anybody thinks of questions later, you can email us at biology at uno.edu. You're welcome to ask us any questions at all. Um, we're more than happy to help. And um, I wish you guys luck in your program. Thank you so much, Wendy. Appreciate your time. Happy Thank Friday. You. Happy Friday to you. <laughs> all right, y'all, that was super exciting. And um, yeah, one of our best partners, our students have been really successful at UNO and uh, it's something to think about. You don't have to have a bachelor's to be successful in your career, but it certainly helps you make a little bit more income. So next up, we have Dr. Alex Ward, who's the Director of Public and Institutional uh, Partnerships at Origin. And I believe she has accompanying her Victoria Regan. Welcome, y'all. Thank you. Thank you for having us. This is exciting. Uh, Victoria and I um, really enjoy attending these kinds of um, sessions because it gives us an opportunity for us to bring a slightly different view on potential career paths. So both of us are in industry. And so, um, you know, Dr. Schutler did a great job talking about, you know, the opportunities in academia. Um, so I come from an academic background. So my um, I have a PhD in cell biology. So I used to be a cancer researcher in my former life and um, talking about PCRs and protein synthesis and all of that, that's right up my alley. Um, however, I, I ended up taking a slightly different path. And so um, I'll tell say a little bit about my career path and then talk about the company that we work for. And I'll let uh, Victoria chat a little bit about what her career path and, and how she joined Origin. Um, so for me, I did my undergrad in bio. Um, I did an honors um, with a thesis and in, in a focus on immunology. I then went on to do my PhD um, in cell biology. I worked for the pharmaceutical industry for a period of time as um, a, a medical writer for risk management plans. So if you think about all the, you know, the pamphlets that you get inside your, your medication that tells you about all the potential risks, like hot dog fingers, growing like a third limb, all of that. So that was all part of um, some of the work that I integrated from the clinical studies um, that are conducted, but I prim primarily focused on oncology drugs. Um, I then transitioned out and I was a professor at a college where I'm based out of, so I'm Canadian, and I'm based out of uh, Windsor, Ontario, that's right across the river from Detroit. And so, um, and then Victoria is based in Sarnia. So if you think about the Michigan Mint, we're kind of on the tip of the thumb. Um, and so um, we, what I ended up teaching in the nursing faculty at a local college. And so I taught anatomy and physiology. Um, I had a baby in between, and then I decided to go into industry. And so I, I have done things like 
manage the IP, the intellectual property portfolio for academic institutions. I also worked as a business development manager for an arm's length organization to um, the government of Ontario. Ontario is one of the major provinces here in Canada. Um, and then I, I also run, I have my own consulting firm. And so it's out of my own consulting firm that I got hired by Origin. So um, as an academic, uh, you end up gaining this expertise and ability to write grants. So I know uh, Dr. Rosenzweig and Schlutler and everybody else that is in the academic world, like you, you kind of live and die on writing grants. And so um, part of my skill had been that. And so I, I happened to pick up a contract with a, a little known company at the time, Origin Materials, uh, and they just wanted me to be their grant writer. And so as I got hired on as a consultant for three months, um, I ended up just my scope continued to grow. And because I had a lot of um, I had a lot of um, adaptability and I could take the skills that I'd learned in academia and in my undergrad and graduate school, um, as well as as a business development manager professor. So I was able to take all of those skills and kind of bring them into um, my role. So I've been with the company now for just almost seven years, um, just over seven years. And um, and so I've I've had a, a variety of iterations uh, with a company. So company-wide, I'm the director of public and institutional partnerships. However, in Canada, I'm, I'm the senior executive person. So I'm the president of the chemical research entity for Origin Materials. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what Origin does. Um, I'll share my screen. Uh, so this is just our fourth quarter uh, earnings call, which came out not too long ago. And so because we're a publicly listed company, we have to have a lot of these forward looking statements and disclaimers. Don't worry about reading them. So this is really who we are in a nutshell. And so we are a company whose core technology is hinges on converting biomass. So you think about all the waste biomass that might be in Louisiana that could be you know, sawdust, it could be bagasse, it could be, you know, maybe not in Louisiana, but cotton trash. So we've tested and trialed a couple dozen different types of uh, plant material uh, through our process. Um, and so we essentially convert that, use a chemical sledgehammer, um, essentially it's a chemocatalytic process in a reactor that then breaks apart all of the biomass and converts it into platform chemicals. So those platform chemicals are essentially these chemical building blocks that can be used uh, in everyday products. So if you've ever bought like a, a moisture wicking shirt, if you've ever bought some fruit that comes in a clamshell, you ever, you know, have tires, for example, or you have a phone case that's black. So the building block chemicals go into all of that. And so we have a total addressable market of over a trillion dollars a year. Um, because the technology isn't essentially, it's not a one trick pony. It's uh, got quite a bit of um, applicability to a variety of markets. Um, and so we also make, have the potential to make specialty materials. Um, and so the way we are able to downstream derivatize, we're able to, to make some of these specialty chemicals as well. More recently, we announced a PET caps and closures. You're like, why is that even important? So if you look at, uh, for example, a water bottle that you might have, I don't have a water bottle, but I have my, my protein drink here. Um, and so for this, all caps are made, are usually made from something called HDPE, and it's not made from polyethylene terephthalate. So if you've ever had to recycle something and you turn the bottom and there's a little, you know, triangle that says number one, that's polyethylene terephthalate. And so it's the most ubiquitous polymer. It's used in a variety of applications and it's the most recycled. And so the technology until we developed, it did not exist to make PET caps. Um, so it's a huge advance in, in, in the technology. And what's interesting about that is that now with our technology, you can take a bottle, whether it's your whatever water bottle, soda bottle, and the body of the bottle is usually made with PET, but the lid hasn't been. But now with our technology, the whole thing can be recycled. So when you're done, you just throw the whole thing in the recycling bin and away you go. So there's the HDPE doesn't contaminate the recycling streams. Um, and you also have an opportunity to recycle more material than you did in the past. And we can make it from any kind of material. It can be 
recycled PET, it can be virgin PET, and it can be bio-based PET. So our, our technology has quite a bit of uh, flexibility and adaptability. Um, and so something that we've been doing, so our company has been scaling since 2008. It was established by a couple of UC Davis grads, uh, chemical engineers. And, um, and so what we've been doing is slowly scaling up. So most of you probably have experience in, say, at the bench scale where you're testing things, you know, within the context of a lab. And so when you're scaling a technology, you go from bench scale that you're making a few grams of something to pilot scale where you're making kilograms of something. And then you have to scale up to that next scale, which might be like in the tons of material. And so that's what we did in Sarnia, Ontario, and why we hired people like Victoria is to help us with a brand new plant that we opened last July. And so that plant is already now taking woody biomass and converting it into our platform chemicals. And that plant has the capacity to produce thousands of tons of material a year. And what's even more exciting and more applicable to you folks is that we announced building a full-scale commercial plant that would be making hundreds of thousands of tons of material in Geismar, Louisiana. And so we intend for that plant to have um, more than 200 people employed, people like pilot operators, engineers, uh, analytical chemists. And so um, you folks are really well positioned to train towards those kinds of jobs. And what's interesting about us is that it doesn't have to be some kind of special set of skills. If whatever, I, I think that Delgado is doing a great job training folks um, to have the skills necessary to have these kinds of industry jobs. So I'm gonna turn it over to Victoria to talk a little bit about her role at our company and, and how uh, her trajectory uh, of her career has developed. Hey everyone, um, yes, my name is Victoria. Um, so I actually started out um, with a college program. Um, so I took uh, chemical production and process engineering, which was a four-year diploma. Um, and then I also had an inter internship with a biochemical company here as well. Um, and that was about eight months. Um, so with that experience, I got the hands-on experience and got to kind of see exactly what the job I was looking at um, was going to entail. Um, and upon a graduation at that program, I really didn't think it was the path for me. Um, so I actually continued on to um, the University of Windsor, Windsor for um, an undergrad um, program um, uh, for my bachelor's in engineering technology. And I actually loved <laughs> the engineering part of that. Um, so when I got out of there, um, I ended up going back to where my internship was um, and got hired on to a full-time position where I was working as a, a chemical process operator. Um, and then uh, while I was there, um, on lunch one day, I heard that um, there was a new company um, coming into the same kind of bio-industrial park um, we, I was in, um, went over with my resume, um, and that was actually Origin. Um, and I've now been here for six and a half years. Um, so I started out as a level one process operator. Um, and currently, um, I'm a chemical process um, operations lead. Um, so the same pilot plant um, that I started with, um, I've been running for the last two years um, with a team of six operators, um, two engineers and a technical expert. Um, and overall, the career has been awesome. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed it. Um, we do, because we're taking that small bench scale technology um, and bringing it up, um, there's a lot of unknowns. Um, every day is different. You're not doing the same routine jobs. Um, and then on top of that, just the team here at Origin has just been um, so supportive and allowing you kind of to grow. Um, currently, I'm actually shifting a little bit into a new role. Um, so I'm going to be um, in charge of training um, and organizing all the training for our operations team at the new manufacturing site that Alex mentioned. So that's about me. <laughs> yeah, and I think a lot of companies like us um, are uh, are aware of the importance of investing into our employees and training them and providing opportunities for growth. Um, so when we first started as a company, we are a little bit bimodal in the sense that we had folks that were like very early career and then folks that were very mature in their career. And so as we've grown, we've been able to 
create a more even distribution of folks in the, as well. We now have mid-career um, people, but um, we see the the need for investing in our in our people as uh, incredibly important to our culture and important to to the way we do business. Um, we think that folks that are Appreci feel appreciated are, are going to be better employees. Um, and so we, we try to create um, pathways for career growth that is conducive to what the individual prefers. Um, so within my company, for example, when I started, I was a grant writer and um, I've managed technical programs. Uh, so one of the things that I didn't talk about was we produce this solid compound that essentially used like you looks like used coffee grounds coming out of our um, reactor. And so that is being developed to be uh, carbon black. So if you've ever had to replace a, a car tire or a bike tire and get that sooty material on your fingers, that's carbon black. But we're making it out of bio-based materials. And so I manage that platform both on the R&D side as well as, as the commercial side. Um, I, I do government relations now. I also um, do quite a bit of the community benefits work. I did it in Sarnia. I've been working really closely with um, folks like Dr. Rosenzweig to, to implement some community benefits as well in Louisiana, well in advance of us actually becoming, you know, a staple in, in the Geismar community. Um, and so I encourage all of you to think about your careers in not like a linear path, a lot of us have had careers that have taken, you know, left and right turns, um, but ultimately all of those opportunities really uh, lend themselves to creating more skills and creating the adaptability that that's needed sometimes to to embrace challenging technologies um, like the one that Origin is scaling. Thank you so much, Alex and Victoria. Um, just a little plug about the Geismar plant. Delgado received a half million dollar grant through NSF with a company, with a consortium called Biomade to specifically introduce bioindustrial manufacturing skill sets into our classes. And one of our faculty members is going to be starting to be trained this summer. And then the entire crew will be starting to be trained next summer. And these skill sets are being developed directly with industry, including Origin, to ensure our students have the skills to transition into a potential employment opportunity. And so I've been working with Alex, and I guess I'm going to be working with Victoria a lot more in the future um, to ensure that we are aligning curriculum with what industry needs. I wanted to also add, this isn't a question, more like a statement. There's been a trend with our students' interests in like bioremediation and ecological preservation and like being more, more eco-friendly. So I I'm so happy that y'all presented so that they can see that like you can take other products and make them more sustainable and like recyclable in a way. And I don't think that's something you typically think about with laboratory sciences, you know, that you can actually take products that maybe aren't the best and make them better for the planet. So thank you so much for sharing that. That's really great to see. Of course. Yeah. And I think that can be the case for all products. Um, I think sustainability doesn't necessarily require these like deep behavioral changes for humans. We can take the existing things that, that we use every day and just decarbonize them and make them from, you know, waste biomass um, instead of other other sources um, that tend to have a heavier footprint. But thank you all for having me and Victoria. Alex, I just have one, it's a statement, but I would love for you to comment on it. The first yeah. time I met Alex, we actually discussed and I was like, well, you know, the area you're in is known as Cancer Alley. And she yeah. goes, we have been working on environmental justice and social justice. So I would like you to explain that y'all spent a lot of time down there working with the community. Yes, yeah. So I think um, in the year and a half, I guess, since we announced, almost two years since we announced um, the Geismar plant, I think I've spent something like 12 weeks in Louisiana talking to the local community, talking to um, the various mayors. Um, so Geismar, for those that might not be familiar, is uh, in Ascension Parish. 
And so I've talked, I've spoken to the parish president, I've spoken to their COO to understand what the needs of the community are. And as we integrate ourselves into the community, what, what's the best way that we can help the community um, and to ensure that, that we are good citizens of both you know, our neighbors, but also the, the water and the air. And so, um, you know, having those consultations and just being open to listening, because it's not going to be Canadian Alex Ward coming into Geismer saying this is how sh things should be done for environmental justice. That's just, you know, that's a colonizing mentality. I think what's important is to think about what is it that the community needs are um, and, and, and understanding where we can make, we're not a, a big company, but where can we make the biggest impact and where can we invest in the community? Um, and so that, that it, we've looked at different options, uh, things like supporting community centers, uh, scholarships. Um, so in Canada, something that we've done with the local college is established uh, scholarships for um, Indigenous uh, individuals. So um, in Canada, we just have slightly different types of marginalized uh, folks. And so within about a thousand, I, mean, I was going to say a thousand meters, I'll say just over a thousand yards um, of, the, of, of our plant, um, there's a community called the Amjanan community. And so that's an indigenous community that's been there for hundreds of years. And so we want to make sure that we're, um, you know, very conscious about how we do business, how we protect the community, how we prevent any kind of contamination. And, and also, um, you know, we we don't want to be a contributor <laughs> to Cancer Alley. We want to be part of the solution and reducing um, the environmental load uh, in that corridor. Well, we have about one minute. Does anyone have any lingering questions or comments? Well, I cannot thank you enough, Alex and Victoria, for joining us today. We truly appreciate it. And again, I'll be sharing out the um, recorded video once we clean it up and the presentation. Thank you so much. And this will lead us right into our next presenter. Let me switch screens real quickly. All right. So next up, we have Dr. Cecilia Sanchez, the Chief Scientific Officer and Vice President of Research and Development at Abtala Sciences. Hey. Welcome. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm going to share a presentation. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you see it? Yes, we can. Thank okay. you. Okay. So, um, I wanted to follow up a little bit on what Obatala Science is and what my role is as a chief scientific officer and what type of background and our research we do. So at Obatala Science, we try to look for a world in which we can have preclinical models that can really uh, create future therapy. So we want a preclinical model that are accessible, equitable, and effective for patients worldwide. And for us, it's very important that demographic and socioeconomic backgrounds are taken into account when we design preclinical models for growth. So over the last time, we had the audience, uh, in New Orleans, the audience is a small business, minority-owned business. Um, so what we do here is that we manufacture stem cells from adipose tissue and other um other type of tissues, and we create this uh, adipose tissue kit, and that are able to support and balance our cells in metabolic disease and regenerative medicine. For example, we uh, last year we launched the obesity and chip model which really recapitulate what an obese individual is, but in an in vitro model. And that will help for a better screening of drops and compounds against obesity, diabetes, and, and metabolic disorders. We were the first in develop a human derived hydrogen, and that is used to create these constructs 
uh, to um, grow health through the really, and that applies for what we call the organ on a chip model. And part of what we do is to try to be sure that we represent our diverse population in this using the stem cells from a variety of individuals uh, with different backgrounds. So we have different types of products, hydrogen, stem cells, media, tissue, kids, models. So I am the chief scientific officer for Lovatara Science. So what it means? So the chief scientific officer is basically an executive position that manages and develop uh, research. And so we basically, um, in my position, we need to lead all the research operations uh, of the company. Uh, we are also, um, uh, we need to manage a team, um, research team. And we also uh, implement and develop strategies that allow the company to define what, what is the new product that we will develop, what is the, um, the uh, best uh, scientific partnership that we can develop, and also strategize about our communication. Um, so how was my journey? <clears throat> I started studying medicine. I, I went to many medical school at uh, 16 years old. And one year there, uh, and I realized that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to be more in the science part. I was born with a medical condition, and I was always very interested in medicine, we get out in medicine, things like that. But also, um, I realized that I wanted to understand more from the science point of view, more than from the um, treatment or clinical aspect uh, directly. So I wanted to understand things. And so I decided to do a bachelor in microbiology and medical science. And then I moved to France to study French for a year, and I stayed there for a long time. Uh, so I did a, an internship, and that was the key. I, I did an internship in a laboratory in genetics, and then that bring me to do a master in biology and health, so combining the basic science and the clinical aspect. And then I was able to do a PhD in a Louis Pasteur University in France. So that was like the academic track. No? So then I came back to America, and I wanted to do a postdoc. And so I did a postdoc in genetics at Tulane University, and then a second one on the stem cell. And, and then I had um, a small, uh, you know, um, uh, time between, between, in academia, break in my, in my career. I had my, baby, my kids, I got married and all that. Uh, so I had like two years a gap before I start going back in academia. Did a small postdoc that led me to an assistant professor. So I was an assistant professor in the pulmonary division at Tulane, the Department of Medicine, for over five years. And so that was like the hardcore academic plan, basically. But, um, you know, family reasons, you know, we decided to move, and to me, it was an opportunity to just to make a different career move. So sometimes when, when things happen, you just don't need to be open to new opportunities. And that was a jump that I made at that point to industry. So we moved to another state, and I was able to uh, work with an international company a French company, um, and I was a principal investigator for after development and diagnostic devices. And that very quickly led me to be the innovator uh, team lead for the company. And because my family uh, live in Louisiana, and I, and I love Louisiana, and specifically the audience, I wanted to always come back, and I had the opportunity to come back as the big people for research and development, at Obatala Science. 
And uh, very quickly, I got also the chief strategic officer position. And that chief in academia at that time, in, uh, uh, in industry at that time in my career in academia, was uh, in fact only possible by um, keeping the uh, training. So always try to get opportunities to study, to get courses, classes, anything. So I was able to um, learn about block and medical device development, project management, uh, compliance, regulatory compliance, good documentation practices, all those skills that you like to get graphs over time help me to be the person that could fill the position at the time that the position was open. So that's what happened. Um, so what is a uh, chief scientific officer for Obatala? So for Obatala, we do research and development of new products. So for example, we develop biomaterials. And talking about recycling, we in fact take waste materials material that is discarded during liposuction or medical procedures. And we isolate stem cells, we isolate material to create human-based hydrogel, and we develop microphysiological systems, that what we call a uh, organonachi. Dr. Sanchez, I'm so yeah. sorry to interrupt. I'm not sure if you're advancing slides, but we're not seeing anything but the first slide. Oh, I am advancing a slide. Oh I my apologize. Gosh. I didn't know if it was intentional, but now that you're talking about the stem cells, I figured there might be slides. Yes, and I see it. Um, I see it in the in the screen that I am showing, and I am. Um, and in fact, the slides uh, have animation, so maybe that's the problem. I don't know. Uh, let me stop sharing and like to show again. That is, um, no idea. Um, okay, I'm going to like to show again. I'm sorry. Um, now we're seeing see the um, hydrogel stem slot cells media slide. Okay, so I guess I don't know how to, but can you see how it moves now? Now we're seeing it. Thank you. Okay, okay. I'm sorry so, to interrupt. Yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry. So I guess you only saw the first one. I we were listening, so we, you can move to your <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm so sorry. I thought we were we were watching. Yeah. Um so anyway, this is open data science. Our product. So we manufacture adequate tissue and uh, supporting materials and creating organ on that chip models. And we have hydrogen, stem cells, and media and tissue uh chip skin. Um, I told you about, about Chief Scientific Officer role, and uh, I, um, I wanted to explain a little bit about my career path. So, um, I think that's where we are, we lost the connection. Um, can you see the, the movement the of the slide? Like the My Journey slide? Yeah. Yes, that's where we're on right now. Okay. So, yeah, basically that's um, what I was trying to explain, how moving from academia, going to industry, and in industry, like to get a different um, uh, background, um, oh, additional training that allow to progress in the industry level. Um, I already don't know if I am, uh, you can see the, <laughs> I'm, I'm really worried we are not seeing. Okay, so as our search scientific officer, can you see the slide, really? Yeah. 
Um, yes, we can see it now. Okay, we manufacture you know, human beings having a gen, a man's head, and support it with all for microphysiological function. So we name the waste material from liposuction and uh, other um, uh, medical procedures. And from that material, we isolate the stem cells and the hydrogens. Um, so we also develop what cells methods, assays, and uh, different types of components. And I oversee all the research processes that happen in the company. Uh, we analyze data, present the data, share the findings. Uh, we uh, we do, uh, you know, perform uh, publications, networking, grant applications, obviously, that will support our research and development programs. And I'm also sometimes in customer calls to try to answer specific questions. And I am also um, um, in close communication with the other executive team members to be able to build a company strategy in product development and, yeah, and processing. So, um, on that, let me move the slide. Um, can you see the change? Yes, okay. So, my name, yes, and then for example. So, meeting from the, with the standard uh, executive meeting teams, Laboratory meetings, talking about product development, process, and research cycle. Uh, I was also in the lab doing manufacturing for new products. So it's not only on a desk, it's not only reading and, and doing that work, it's a lot of also being able to have the flexibility to be on the desk and also be in the lab and get hands on as needed. Um, we also look at uh, regulatory compliance from some documents. We close a uh, service company yesterday. We had meetings with other partners in all the chip models, writing and networking even um, to support our inventory of stem cells. So that happened in one day, for example. So every day is very different. It's a lot of different activities that are related with science in a biotech company. And the important thing is to be able to prioritize the project, manage uh, people, and always keep the bigger picture of the company strategy. And the work cannot be done alone. And so it was very important to start with a scientific team that have the skills, that want to learn more every day. So we have um, a scientific team that, you know, some have a bachelor degree, some have a master degree, some have a PhD. And as we are increasing our manufacturing um, platform, we would like to have more at the early, early stage uh, career, uh, technical level, and move forward in the company. Um, as I said, my, my path is not a classic path. We move from academia to industry in many ways, and sometimes very, very early. I did it very late for different circumstances, but, you know, if, uh, I think everybody made his own way in, in some, um, yeah. Um, in terms of career plan, uh, I would say always continue education. Um, um, in the terms in terms of my the company that I am, so it's basically innovation. So we need to be always in the cutting age for innovation in products and services. Uh, continue working for our mission, which is provide population diversity in the medical model, provide opportunity for our community in Louisiana for training a job in research, in manufacturing, in product development, quality insurance, and laboratory operation, and to uh, provide opportunities for students to learn about uh, uh, other parts different to academia. Um, so 
connect intention ourselves at uh, Obatala right now. We are focusing on our major problem, which is in blood screening. Uh, it's uh, an issue that when a blood is in discovery, you have about like 10,000 compounds. And at the end of the day, you have only one that is FDA approved. And it's a really challenge uh, that this because of the time and the cost that takes to develop a block, it's like 20 years. And so the, the limitation there is the preclinical development, the preclinical uh, prior, and the preclinical studies of models uh, are based in animals, animal studies, or some in vitro studies that doesn't recapitulate our difference in our population. Uh, in terms of age, gender, ethnicity, and distinction status. So that's what we are trying to, to do at Obatala. So we create this biomaterial. So last year, again, we developed the obesity on a chip that using our stem cells and our hydrogen and from, uh, a license from Harvard, we developed this model that works for drug efficacy for um, obesity and diabetes. Um, so this year we have several projects in terms of stem cell biology, hydrogen, development of different type of media for cell culture, and development of organoids like calcium organoids. So um, saying that, um, that uh, indicates that we we are very active and obviously we have internship opportunities. We are always welcome those opportunities. We partner with different local programs and we are also uh, interested in getting internship opportunities for the students that can get credit for those internships. And and that can be in the area of research and development and laboratory prevention. So manufacturing, stem cells, and other research projects, as well as business and science. Uh, we are not currently hiring, but hopefully a uh, position will be open probably next year. This year we are not doing it, but internships, we are always active on, on that. Um, that's it. Um, if you have any questions, here my contact information. And I apologize again for, for the slide. Um, yeah, missing the slide. Thank you um, so much, Dr. Sanchez. Um, it's so exciting to see all this stuff happening at Avatala because we see it in the news all the time. Y'all are making such a huge impact within the community as well as the research area. And we truly appreciate the support you've given our students over the past four or five years. We've had quite a few go through with internships with y'all, so thank you. Thank you, we no, I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to to work with uh with you and and the community and you know if you know one of the things I will say that I originally was um feeling that I will miss from academia is that contact with the students and all that. And we are finding the way to maintain that uh, in the industry. So that, that is good. Um, yeah. Well, it's exciting to see y'all's progress and we appreciate you allowing Delgado to be a part of y'all's uh, future too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so that is going to lead us directly into our next speaker. All right, everybody. Next, we're welcoming uh, Dr. Richie Pro uh, Provost, who's the lab manager at Southwest Engineers, an industrial water treatment company, I believe. Welcome, Dr. Provost. Hello, everybody. Hey, April. Um... <laughs> I have a PowerPoint if I can get it to cooperate. Did that show up for everybody? Yes, we can see it. Um, and I totally didn't have it open because I forgot to add a slide about me. Um, so 
Hi, uh, yes, I work for Southwest Engineers. We are an industrial water treatment company um, that does mean more than just wastewater, which I will get to because that is the first question I always get. Oh, so you mean like, like sewage treatment? Like that is one of the fields we're in, but I'll get there. So, you know, we've talked a lot about people's backgrounds. So I got my bachelor's from IUPUI in Indianapolis. And I always tell everybody that I got tired of walking through the snow and pulling ice out of my beard when I walked across campus. So my dad's from Louisiana. So I applied to come down here and I was accepted at, um, at UNO into the PhD program where I got a, my PhD in materials chemistry. I was making nanostructures for the enhancement of photovoltaic devices, which is really big words to say I made really fancy solar cells. Um, and it was really cool. Got to learn a lot of cool research techniques. And uh, I was lucky enough to be able to stay on for a little while as an adjunct professor, um, teaching some non-science courses um, and general chemistry labs because they needed someone and I knew how. And then I moved to Xavier as a coordinator for their chemistry resource centers, um, which are tutoring centers. There's, they do more than that. But um, so I went from teaching classes to tutoring students who were in the classes. And then here at Southwest Engineers, they had an opening for a lab manager. And I knew the technical director. She called looking for employees. And I was like, well, here's my application. And so here we are. And I know some one of the earlier presenters mentioned, you know, careers are not linear. I started out getting my bachelor's at IUPUI. That campus had five hospitals within walking distance. It was a heavily bioanalytical campus. Um, so I thought, you know, chemistry is doing analytical. I will be running an HPLC for the rest of my life. Like that is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be an analytical chemist. And then when I came to UNO, um, I learned about materials chemistry, thought it was really cool. And that's, that's why I got my degree in it. And then now, I mean, you know, I went from teaching to tutoring to running a lab. It, it's been a zigzag, but it's been a fun zigzag, right? Um, so switch slides, please. There we go. So Southwest Engineers started before I was born in 1985, um, as a, a very small just water treatment company that's industrial water treatment again um and it's now expanded across multiple multiple states um i think we're from texas up to the carolinas down to florida sort of that triangle the southeast which i know we're southwest engineers but we we work in the southeast it confuses me still after all these years but, but it is what it is um, and we've expanded to, to many, many divisions. Um, the industrial water treatment, of course, is still our core. We do do the wastewater. Um, we have chemicals that go out to automotive companies, paint companies, different refineries and processes, other stuff. We're still expanding, growing, and um, you know, seeing, seeing where our chemistry can be applied, right? So since we're questioning what is um yes a lot of people have gone through you now sorry i just saw the chat um what is industrial water treatment so the easiest one is cooling towers right you've seen these in a lot of places and you probably didn't know what they were um there's some pretty famous pictures of say like a nuclear power plant and you see that big sort of tower with all the steam coming out of the top like that's the classic picture of a, of a nuclear tower right that's a cooling tower um I don't know why this does not want to change slides. There we go. Maybe you guys recognize this one. Um, you get a gold star if you know where this is from. Um, and I definitely didn't pull a screenshot off of Google Maps to get this, but Delgado's cooling tower right here. This is your cooling tower, right? Um, I think from when I looked at the top, you have three vents. And because, you know, this is a school, so what is a cooling tower? Um, so you have Water that comes in, it's usually hot because it's done, it's cooling, right? You have sprayer nozzles. Um, oh, are you actively renovating it? That's funny. Um, so you have sprayer nozzles that spray the water down over what we call fill. It's usually sort of like a honeycomb. There's other methods too. Then you have the air that comes in the side and goes up. So through evaporation and all that, 
you have the heat removed from the water, it exhausts through the top, and you have cold water down here in the basin, right? Um, we're gonna change slides, there we go. So that's how the cooling tower works, but what do we do, right? So as people who live in Louisiana, we know anytime there's water, we get algae growth and other things, mosquitoes, trees. If it can grow in water, it will grow in water, right? So one of our biggest things is preventing that, right? You can imagine if biological things are growing on your cooling tower, that would be bad. I also mentioned, you know, the the, the water aerosolizes in cooling, right? Well, if you have aerosolized water that's full of bacteria, that could be bad, right? Um, you don't want people to inhale all that and get sick. So we we provide biocides. We have a lot of treatment methods for um, for for mitigating that, right? Also, this is a style of fill that I talked about, and you can see here this actually has. I'm pretty sure there's corrosion there in the bottom, but also this is deposits. You know, you get evaporation. You see this in your shower at home, right? The water dries up, leaves behind crud deposits. Um, and then this is a sensor that we use for monitoring different things. I don't know specifically which one this is, but you can see it's also covered in corrosion or not in corrosion in, uh, in uh, hardness deposits, right? So we have chemistry that takes care of that. We use polymers that'll bind with the calcium and the carbonate and, and other things to bind it, to stop it from crystallizing. Um, we have inhibitors that stop this corrosion of the metals. We like to passivate it. Um, we we tailor our chemistry to the needs. So in, we have very hard water here in New Orleans. We have chemistry that's designed for that. Um, in some of our other areas, we have very corrosive water. Um, and so we have chemistries then designed for that too. Um, so then some of the other things we do, um, we do filtration, right? We do pretreatment. So these are different styles of, of pretreatment. Um, this one down here in the bottom left corner is probably what you would be more familiar with. If you have a water softener at home, that's what this is, what some of this is anyway, right? It's a canister full of, um, of resin beads and the water passes through it and filters it. Um, another step of filtration. So this here is a very large reverse osmosis um, system. We actually use a much sm much smaller version here when we produce our chemicals, um, but this is this would be like distilled water, right? Then the next step after this would be deionized de water, which is what you use in the lab a lot. It's absolutely pure, super clean. It's what we use in like the HPLC and stuff, right? Um, here is another system where you see this is a multi-step filtration system. I think it's for an industrial application. Um, something like this would then feed a boiler. Right, so here you see this is a uh, three boilers in series. Um, I I found this picture to kind of give you an idea of scale because sometimes it's hard to understand how big the systems we treat are. Um, these are guys doing an inspection of uh, the same design boiler, um, and you see that I mean they're probably about six foot. And that boiler, their heads are about here, so it's big, right? Um, what I think is cool is you can see this red here is where the flame goes into this boiler. Um, so you have hot, you have fire going in this central tube here, and then the hot gas has come back through these tubes, and then the whole thing around that is surrounded in water, um, and so that's how you heat the water, right? There's there's other designs, but that's specifically how these these ones work. Um, and as you can imagine, if you have something that's hot and sealed, well, we know the ideal gas law, right? So if temperature is going up and the volume can't change, and then the pressure goes up. Right? And so that sort of leads into why our chemistry is important. So I went into our database and pulled out some what are admittedly probably very old pictures. But you see here, when you have high pressure and high temperature, and I, I say high pressure, I had a discussion yesterday about a boiler that runs at 600 PSI. Um, I would call that high pressure, but as far as boiler goes, it's actually still considered relatively low pressure, right? But you see here, this pipe, has been heavily deposited. So you get you know, phosphates, carbonates, other things, metals that deposit, cause problems, right? Um, you get insulation, 
So then the pipes have to get hotter. It's uneven, so you get uneven heating. With that pressure, then you can turn your tubes into spaghetti, which is not good. Um, you don't want your tubes to to, to melt and, and all that. That wasn't ready to click yet. You also get, um, so we, ha we have chemicals like in the cooling towers to deal with that. Um, we also have oxygen scavengers because if you have iron pipes and oxygen with a lot of heat and pressure, what happens? You get iron oxide, which is water soluble to an extent, and you end up with things like this. This is a, a hole that has worked its way through the wall of a pipe. You can see the corrosion here, and then that's the hole in the center, right? We also get, you know, fun crystals grow. We get galvanic um, reactions and all that. So we have chemistry, depending on the system, that, that helps mitigate that, right? Um, and this slide I kept in because I definitely borrowed some of these from someone else's presentation. This is a technician inside of a boiler, removing these are scale deposits from the inside of the boiler. You see him scraping off the inside of a tube. Um, and I just thought this was fascinating because these boilers really are big enough that you can climb inside of them. And one of our technicians does. That's part of his job is inspecting boilers, which I'm way too claustrophobic for that, but hey. Um, so that's what the company does as a whole. Where does the lab come in? Besides sort of all that, you know, we do do um, a lot with the guys in the field, but a lot of our focus is on like formulation, right? So we know what the water is for someone's system, usually a new customer, or if a customer is changing water sources or something. We know the fundamentals of the chemistry, right? A lot of it is general chemistry. Um, a lot of uh, redox reactions and things to, to try and avoid. So we can formulate blends that we then scale up. We create blend sheets and our guys in the plant, this is actually a picture from our plant, um, blend chemicals to order, right? So they have a sheet and it tells them, you know, put thousand pounds of water, put 10 pounds of this, you know, whatever. Um, we package it and then we ship it out, right? Um, and what I always found was interesting, you know, I was trained as a chemist, our, um, we learn to chemicals come in little bottles, but here we get chemicals in containers like this, right? Um, here's a picture from one side of our storage warehouse where these are just raw chemicals, polymers and things that we mix into our blends, um, which to me is fascinating. This is one of our larger blending tanks. You can see uh, this is one of our my colleagues. He's six-ish feet tall standing next to the tank. They have to take the stairs up to get things into the tank, right? Um, and then this is them filling the barrel. So where the lab comes in is sort of right here between these two pictures. They blend the chemicals, they bring a retain to us, and we analyze it in the lab. So these are retain bottles, they're our, our blended chemical, and then we do different tests depending on it, uh, on, on what the, the product is. I do a lot of HPLC, our, all our biocides go through here, most of our biocides go through here to make sure that the active ingredient, the actual biocide is the concentration we said it was. Um, a lot of spectroscopy and titrations. Um, and it's because I clicked on the chat, it doesn't want to endure. Okay. Um, and we also do investigations, right? So these were samples that I just had sitting in the lab that looked interesting. These are pipes that have corroded through. You see deposition on the inside. This is corrosion from the outside, which I haven't figured out yet. Um, these are corrosion coupons. They're metals that are what's in the system that we treat. And we have a manifold that the water goes through. We also do biological testing to make sure there's no bugs and stuff in there. Um, so I kind of rushed through the lab part of that, but um, we're involved in everything, right? We test the customer's water, their system, whatever they get sent to us to see what it looks like. We help to de develop treatments. And if something goes wrong, we figure out what's wrong. Um, and if you have, have questions for me, that's my contact info. Um, we have a sales force that does this, the treatment side of this. Um, and if you're interested in getting into that, that is um, the office email that goes to the big bosses. Um, and yeah, I happily answer some questions. I have questions. 
Hell yeah. <laughs> I actually have two, and one is just more advice. So moving forward, working with Origin, and we're incorporating bio-industrial manufacturing um, curriculum, but one of the issues in developing any of this curriculum is the scaling up and working with students to understand that. Um, because in a community college lab, even in some university labs, we don't have that ability to scale up. Do you, um, is that something that y'all train at the facility once someone gets hired or do you expect them to have that experience already? Or what do you think the best mechanism is as a program to incorporate scale up? So scaling isn't always linear, right? But coming in, we don't really expect you to know it. We need you to know the fundamentals of chemistry, right? If you add this acid to water, it's going to get hot because you are adding a lot of acid to a lot of water, right? In a way that is safe if you do it right, right? Um, I will say a lot of the chemistry that we do is safe, right? Like we're mixing, we're mixing polymers in water, doing a lot of blending and dilution. But the scaling part of it is like, we do with that in the lab. Uh, my technical director and I are the ones that sort of figure out the important interactions on like a leader scale in the lab. And if it does anything weird, then we investigate it first, right? Maybe we'll make a five gallon bucket of it instead of going to making 10,000 pounds of it, right? And if we have any questions, that's what we go back to the literature. Um, I really don't like admitting how many titrations I do because that was the one thing I hated in Gen Chem and how much reading, right? I go back to, I have a Gen Chem book. Like I've gone back and I'm like, why is it doing this? And fundamental chemistry. Um, but yeah, no, as far as being able to scale, we do the heavy lifting and we expect, you know, the people that like in our, our blending plant and stuff, um, we just need you to follow the directions and know titrations are the worst. Absolutely. <laughs> um yeah we want them to know the basics like uh, ph electrolysis my technical director is sitting over here and adding her two cents um and yeah okay so a follow-up question is in general it may not be right now but do y'all offer internship opportunities not really okay. um most of our our workforce is in the field doing the actual application, right? Um, we call them the sales force, but they're the ones putting the chemicals in the towers and the boilers and all that. Doing the frontline type, like troubleshooting, they run a lot of the same tests I do. So you saw in the background one of those pictures, I have a big spectrometer. They have spectrometers that are, I mean, this is my cell phone, but about that big, a little bit bigger, that they do the same tests, right? So it's all in the field. They take a couple of minutes each and they can look and say, oh, wow, there's, 40 ppm of iron in this system, that's a lot. Uh, something's wrong, right? Um, so there, there aren't a lot of opportunities for inter internships, unfortunately. Would you allow a small group of students to come for a viewing, <laughs> a visit? Um, I would have to clear that with the higher ups. It, it, <laughs> She said you'd have to define small. Um, well, our class size is pretty small at Delgado, especially in the chem tech and biotech programs. So I was just thinking some of um, April's, uh, you know, chem tech analysis students, she might have two or three at the most in a semester. I think that's something we could talk about. Okay. For sure. As I was thinking, put more than about five people in my lab is crowded. Um, just because of the benches and stuff. But yeah, she nodded. Okay. So it's something we can talk about. And I know Hello, April, thank you. April and I are seeing each other next week. So okay. <laughs> my job is to be the question asker and get yeah, opportunities. Absolutely. No, we love questions. But our next speaker does a lot of scale up. So we've worked with him um in in the throughout the years and he does huge scale up. So well and to, if you if you look at the fundamentals of our chemistry, it's old, right? Uh, I literally last week heard a story of like early boiler treatments were like in steam, steam boats and the boilers blew up a lot. 
and the ones that didn't blow up were the ones that they were cooking potatoes in the boilers. And the I think it was the tannins from the peels were protecting the boilers from corrosion, right? And they figured it out on accident. And so like our chemistry is old and tri trial and error and all that. So the scale up has been done for us. Um, it's where we get into polymers and stuff, the new stuff that sometimes is like, well, it crashed out. I don't know why. We made pretty crystals. We shouldn't have done that. Um, There's actually that book. I don't know. You were at the talk that was about steamboats. It was like a while ago, but there's the book is about like this. I have to finish reading it, but it's like the chemistry with the steamboats. It's it's really cool. We have one. Um, the person was telling me the story. He's uh he's the the third of our technical department. He spends most of his time in the field climbing in boilers. Um, he he named a book yesterday, and he was like, "Have you read it?" I didn't even know it existed until you just said it. So no. Okay. I sent you the picture. I read like the first five pages, but I had to finish it. <laughs> of a book. Yes. Okay. <laughs> of a book. Well, I cannot thank you enough for your time um, and your knowledge and experience and sharing it with the students and the faculty. We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And I'll let April follow up with the potential visits. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, our next speaker has been a huge supporter of Delgado for the past few years, and he always keeps me on my toes, and he does love New Orleans, so he does show up here, I would say, at least once a year. So I'm going to let Charlie take over. Okay, y'all are going to have to not judge me because I've never said this word before, but I can anticipate what it might be. So welcome everyone, Dr. Jacob Nally. He's the director of agronomy at Qualitas Health, which is like a nutrition company. It might sound weird, but uh, laboratory science plays a role in almost all fields. So welcome, Dr. Nally. Hey, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, can everyone see me and hear me? Yes. Awesome. Hey, so I'm uh, I'm in our field lab today. So uh, yeah, I just, I have good internet, uh, but people might walk in the background. So if that's the case, uh, I'm sorry. Um, let's see. So I'm going to share my presentation. Thank you so much for, for having me. I it's quite an honor to be able to talk to all of you and, and tell you a little bit about uh, what I do and maybe some opportunities uh, in the future for for all of you in the algae space, if anyone's super interested in this. Can everyone see this presentation now? Yes. Awesome. Cool. I'm going to uh, I'm going to start a timer to make sure I keep myself on task here. Um, perfect. Well, yeah. So um, like uh, I was introduced, my name is Jake Nally. I'm the director of agronomy at a company called Qualitas Health. Uh, we have a brand of uh, omega-3s that I'll show you a picture of here that's called Ewe. So sometimes we call ourselves Ewe Live. Sometimes we call ourselves Qualitas Health. Um, and so my my main role is to kind of be the person that's on the farm running these big industrial systems. So uh, I, I always love this title. I do a lot of webinars for like retail customers and stuff. And I always talk about like cultivating the future and like welcome to the algae farm. And so that's always my fun role is to tell everyone about kind of how we farm our crop. Um, so uh, I wanted to start telling you a little bit about myself. Um, so I have an undergraduate degree from Loyola University, which is in Chicago. Uh, I got a bachelor's in biology and a bachelor's in environmental science, uh, minors in bioethics. Um, and so that was kind of a fun uh, thing. And I started looking after I kind of was in my junior year looking at what, what to do next. And I ended up deciding to apply for some graduate schools. Uh, I got rejected from a ton of graduate programs, which was great. And I also didn't uh, end up getting into the programs that I had picked, uh, which was one of the best things ever, right? So I applied to go into bird behavior, uh, which I still love today, but um, someone much more qualified took the spot that was open at Michigan State for the bird behavior lab. And so I ended up getting into a lab that was just starting up to look at um, how we could apply algae uh, to look at for biofuel production. So this lab was a very basic lab or basic research lab. So they were looking just kind of at pond dynamics and lakes and streams throughout uh, Michigan. And then they get this like applied grant and they need someone to come in and do this. And I, I didn't have a whole lot of applied research at the time, but I ended up taking on that project. And so I started uh, at Michigan State University in 2011. Uh, and I was looking at how we could take uh, microalgae, 
and essentially put them together, or assemble them to have these really productive or really high growth systems outside, even though, you know, you might have seasonality like a, a really warm day or a cloudy day, winter weather versus summer weather, all of those things. Um, and so I finished my PhD in 2016. I had some cool partnerships along the way, looking at how we could use algae for wastewater, which Amanda was just saying you guys had heard a little bit about in the previous uh, talk as well, which is really cool. Algae can do a lot of really crazy things. And I'll tell you about one of those cool things here in a second. And and kind of along the way in graduate school, uh, I was a GK-12 fellow, which was really fun. I got training to come into uh, eighth grade earth science classrooms and try to develop myself as a science communicator. Um, you know, I don't know a lot about tsunamis, but it was really fun to go in and figure out how to talk to some students and introduce them to some uh, earth science topics like that, right? Um, and then I also did a Spartan Innovations Fellow, which was a small kind of incubator that was in at Michigan State, but it was cool just to get kind of exposed to the business side of technology that can come from uh, from, from universities, right? And the tech transfer and the IP, intellectual property around all of that as well. And so those kind of fellowships along with some of my education are really kind of uh, how I ended up stumbling into the career that I currently have. Uh, it certainly wasn't a direct path. And I think that's really important to just kind of talk about all the stumbles and stuff along the way too. So, um, and I'd love to take questions, you know, at the end about any of these experiences, if you have any as well. Um, so I didn't have this in there, but Amanda messaged me and said, I really hope this thing's in here. So I gave a talk uh, at Algae Prize last year when the Barbie meme thing was huge, right? And so I started my talk out with uh, this can is an algae farmer. It was very topical at the time. It still is really funny, right? Um, but this one, this this uh, hit real hard, which was great. And I got a lot of good laughs to, to loosen everyone up. So I am an algae farmer by trade now, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what that looks like. So we farm a tiny, tiny microorganism, a marine algae, so something that was uh, once growing in the North Atlantic Ocean, and we now grow that in the deserts of Texas, West Texas, way far West Texas. This strain of microalgae is called nanochloropsis. Uh, it's about five microns in size. So they're teeny, teeny, tiny, uh, but this little uh, algae can do a lot of really amazing things. And so from this one, you know, one thing of algae, we can do a number of different uh, value proposition kind of valorization through this, right? You can take the biomass, use it as a feed ingredient for aquaculture or for chickens and cows. You can use it as a soil amendment if you absolutely had to, but really there's a lot of money involved in being able to grow the crop and make uh, human nutrition. From it. And so we can go through this kind of top pathway that's kind of bifurcated a few times. We can extract the oil and that oil can go into supplements. So the product we sell is a competitor to any type of fish oil or krill oil that you can find on the market. If anyone's ever taken a fish oil or krill oil for like heart health or brain health, um, they're not super tasty, uh, but also have a kind of underlying uh, unsustainability, right? We're out there harvesting something in, in natural habitats to then press for oils. And really all that wonderful omega-3 is coming from their algal diet anyway. So we kind of cut out the middle fish is what we say. And we're able to sell an oil that's a vegan oil that does even better than fish or krill oil on a, like a per gram basis. And then after we take that oil out, then we can move the rest of the biomass through this delipidated biomass through and make protein. We've got a really interesting protein. I've, I've tasted it a bunch. We haven't quite got it to market yet, but a full protein that comes from the byproduct of our oil uh, extraction uh, just from this little algae cell. And it, it's really tasty, high protein, high solubility. So imagine any type of muscle milk drink that you found at, at the store, right? Instead of being whey protein, it could be an algal protein, right? And so really quite cool applications for human nutrition. And then everything else that's left over, I have to take the protein out. And after we take the oil out, we ship to companies like uh, Bloom Technologies or uh, Living Inc. And these companies are taking that kind of ash content and turning that algae waste into products like algae plastics or algae inks. So that's kind of where where we sit on the on the scheme of things here. But this is what our product looks like. We have a bunch of different uh, differentiated products. It's all our base oil, our omega-3 oil. And then we have it paired with different items to make it more uh, potent or more uh, specific. Like our brain formula has some uh, green coffee bean extract and phosphatidylserine for like focus and attention. Um, so really cool products. And I really, I really enjoy taking these products. You don't have that kind of nasty reflux or those like what we call fish burps, right? With our product too. Um, and so, yeah, that's what we sell. But the product isn't super interesting. The process is, right? And so um, 
this is our ewe process from farm to sh to shelf uh you know kind of in six different categories i already told you about the strain or the source of allergy which is nanochloropsis um the cultivate side is what we'll talk about because that's what i get to do on a daily basis which is the growth part after we get the algae and I'll, I'll show you what it looks like to grow it and concentrate it or harvest it and dry it it goes through an extraction process we purify that oil and then we put that in a gel cap like you'd be able to buy at whole foods or on amazon or our website and then really what's interesting along the way is number six is ensure this is the last step in the process, but it's happening throughout the entire EWI process to make sure that we're growing a quality product that meets specifications that you're buying. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what that looks like on the lab side. So this is our farm, one of our farms here. This one's in Imperial, Texas, where I'm talking to you from. Uh, it's about 55 acres of total ponds. These ponds are about 1.5 million liters in volume each, and they're about two football fields long. So they're super long, really shallow, only about a foot deep in depth, but they're really long and have a lot of volume. Um, and here's just a couple of photos. If you kind of get closer to it, we have these big paddle wheels that move water around the algaes in there, right? If it's nice and green, we're all happy. So it's always good there. Um, and when we're thinking about industrial processes, why do why exactly do we go to open ponds, right? You can grow them in like a closed systems like photobioreactors, but really by growing them in these big open ponds, we can lower the cost, right? And it's a low uh, complexity, low instrumentation method. So we can really kind of mimic what we do for traditional agriculture, like you might see in crops, uh, you know, around your area. Um, and we can start to kind of steal things from traditional agriculture as well to understand how to grow our crop better. And really being big and, and large volume allows us to be scalable as well, which again, allows us to sell product uh, that's actually competitive on a on a cost basis as well. And uh, going into this, right, to farm something, we really have to understand how to farm our crop. And for every crop, you have to really dig in and understand it at the finest of level. And so here's all the things that we uh, manage and keep in our my, our minds on a daily basis of what we call our agronomic practices, right? We're having to water, we're having to manage our water. There's tons, you know, millions of gallons of water moving around our farm at any point, making sure the nutrients are in line and that the algae is being fed correctly, but not too much. And then ultimately, you know, running correct operational levels, like the pH has to be good, the mixing has to be perfect. And then all of that feeds into harvesting decisions as well. Um, really, some of that stuff we've streamlined, right, and autom um, automated, but the big thing really that we are focusing on is how to grow this crop really well, and that's kind of the crop protection side of things. And so how we inform all these things, this is kind of like the uh, the day in the life of an algae farmer kind of thing, right? Um, we're performing all these daily tasks. We go out and sample the ponds every day. Uh, and we're taking all these different measurements, right? So we're looking at the photosynthetic capabilities, which is what we call PAM. It's a, one of the best tools ever. If you told me I only had 15 grand and I had to run an algae farm, I'd buy a PAM, right? It's the best tool ever. Uh, and it just basically checks to make sure that the algae is healthy by its photosynthetic capabilities. We're checking optical density using like a plate reader, which you might have ex experience with. We're checking the organic and inorganic carbon levels. Um, I, we at times do ash free dry weight samples by hand, which is pretty painful, kind of like what earlier was mentioned with titrations, right? Those are my titrations. They, they're they not great, but you really have to do them, right? Um, and, and check in alkalinity, pH, salinity. The big one that we run a lot is because we're farming an algae product that's an oil product. So we really have to understand the fatty acids in our product as well. And so a fatty acid methyl ester analysis or just a FAME method, running that on a gas uh, chromatographer, GCFID, is really how we do that as well running a lot of nutrient assays, uh, preparing standards and reagents, super important, right? A very, you know, early entry thing on, on making sure that your, your concentrations are correct, but one of the most important parts, because everything downstream doesn't work if you have bad standards. And then the big thing that we do on a daily basis too is do a lot of microscopy and check for rotifers as well. And so I want to show you what that looks like if you're under the scope, uh, what you might look at. Um, and this is kind of the stuff that keeps me up at night, uh, we have weed algae or algae that likes to grow next to our algae because, it, you know, its conditions are just good for it as well. And that can be really harmful for us because if it's not bringing in oil, then that's not really good for our end product as well. So we have to control weed algae. There's predatory bacteria, super tiny stuff that will attach the cell and just kill it from the inside out. Kind of like a, a virus goes in, replicates inside the cell, bursts out and goes and infects more. It's pretty nasty. Predatory algae too, there's bigger algae that like to eat other algae, even though they're still technically called algae. That's one that we really struggle with here in Texas. 
And then amoebas and rotifers, like the zooplankton kind of side stuff, Daphnia, those things really like to eat algae as well. And then the big bucket that really keeps us up at night is the unknown stuff, right? We know what's in the ponds at times, but sometimes you just don't, right? And so that's a, that's a big question for us. And we have to always consistently monitor that. And that's why daily microscopy is the most important thing for us that we do on a regular basis. And all of this kind of feeds into this integrative pest management strategy, which we, again, have kind of gleaned that knowledge from terrestrial ag. And so it's all about, you know, we know what our strain likes, what the weather looks like, how we're monitoring it, and then basically detecting things, having thresholds so that we can react and, and actually do controls, either biological or physical controls, chemical additions like bleach. Um, and then just that, that whole process is cyclical, right? And this helps us grow algae uh, effectively and efficiently. Uh, and also at a lower cost, right? And so this is a really important and integral step for us. So this is a good picture. This is uh, uh, Melba Diaz. She was an intern that came and worked with us for a summer from Lone Star College, uh, a, a fellow part of our ATEC network, which is how I know Amanda and Claire. Um, and so Melba spent a summer out with us. And this picture, her long sleeves are deceiving. She was in the lab all day, so it was cold, right? Because we have air conditioning. It was like 107 degrees this day. And that algae behind her is very, very pretty. And so the, the idea here is that a lot of people would have said you couldn't grow algae at that high of temperature and especially not that colorful because it should have been getting stressed out and turning yellow. But this picture, uh, which was like on her last day of her internship in like August, just is a testament to how effective integrative pest management can be at making good algae throughout some of these really difficult times of the year. Um, and I, I've got two minutes. So here's what the harvesting looks like. We basically take the, on the far left here, that clear or green picture. That's like what a pond might look like. We concentrate that up. And then the best part is that clear water goes through some filters and it's returned back to the pond. So it kind of helps our, our water footprint for sustainability. In my hands in that picture is our dried algae product. So we, we flash off a lot of the water either through a drum dryer or a spray dryer. And then that goes through the extraction process to make the oil, like I mentioned, as, as, as it's leaving the farm. Um, and I wanted to show this too, if I, if this video will work, this is our, can, is it turning on your side? Cool. So this is what we would do field trials in, right? So a lot of terrestrial crops would be in, you know, field plots that are very distinct and, you know, you have like a 10 by 10 little plot or whatever. Ours are mini ponds. These are about uh, 730 liters, but they look like the ponds that we grow our bigger product in. And this is really where we do a lot of our research and development with grants and with partnerships and just kind of new things as well. So I wanted to show you kind of what research looks like on our end as well, because we're actively always doing that to improve our process and improve our and optimize our growth parameters. All right. Perfect. So with that, I wanted to say thanks. I'm actually on. Oh, no. What happened? Hold on. I will. Uh, hold on. I'll stop sharing. I'll go to my final slide and I'll be right back because I had some opportunities on there. I wanted to show everyone for. Um, uh, While Jake's getting yeah. that up, I just want to let everyone know that we are an active member of an algae consortium, an educational um, opportunity network. So we do incorporate algae into our curriculum. Yeah, and you guys had a, a algae prize team last year, right? Yeah, so there's some really cool algae stuff going on at Delgado. And man, I'm sorry. I guess I'm just going to flip through all these slides. I thought I had it all queued up. But there's some opportunities I wanted to show you too, because there's a bunch of algae companies. Unfortunately, I don't have anything currently open. Uh, that's not to say that we won't in the future. But there are several companies that do have posting. Some of them are in uh, either ideal uh, and fun locations if you want to kind of relocate. Or uh, some of them are or hard to get to, like in Hawaii, right? Right? But um, Paso Robles, California, is building a large farm with Global Algae Innovations. They're, they also have a farm in Kauai, Hawaii. Uh, and then Sinotech is on the big island of Hawaii as well, and they have active job postings currently. Gross Wind Technologies is a wastewater company that is using algae and these really cool technology that's on a belt to clean up wastewater and remove nitrogen and phosphate. They're in Iowa. And then uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab, or NREL, always has a bunch of different internships or uh, you know undergraduate level entry positions to kind of come in and learn the lab side of things and they're located in Golden, Colorado as well. So yeah, with that I'll uh, I'll stop and take questions if anyone has any. So Jay, just from my memory and I that may not be the best thing to say, when we were in Golden in 2023 for the algae prize, NRL internships are like fully paid they cover travel is that does that sound familiar okay 
So yeah, these absolutely. internships are fantastic opportunities and they're pretty much open year round, I believe, but for the summer. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, almost. Yeah. And you can get them that are like a 12 month appointment, six month appointment, three month appointment. And what's great is that the, the program that Amanda mentioned uh, is funded through NREL, the algae consortium that we're all part of. So it's it's not like that we have a, a, a an easy entry point, but we certainly have a lot of connections at NREL uh, for feeling out these opportunities. And they would love to fund a tech folks or, you know, schools to get, to fill these internships. So, yeah, that's a, it's a great one. And something that Jake didn't mention is that him and some of his colleagues started a summer algae science um, opportunity for K through 12 teachers. And Delgado does host that often. So we've had three, um, we call it sassy, but we bring K through 12 teachers in and we teach them about algae curriculum, incorporating it into their curriculum, and then they get years worth of equipment and materials as well as support to incorporate that into their science curriculum. So a lot of um, of the work that Jake does is very philanthropic and for the community and Delgado gets the benefit and share it with the community also. We love working with Delgado. It's cause we're in New Orleans. Nay, hey, no complaints there either. We love visiting, right? Yeah, it's a great time. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Well, as Bye. always, Dr. Natalie, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Always great learning and hearing about your work. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Thanks. So this brings us to our last but very important speaker of the day. Um, let me share the screen. One of our biggest supporters of Delgado's SLT program. Yes, yeah, so if you guys are students with us, you've definitely heard about the USDA. They're one of our most uh, supportive partners in the city. And quite a few of our students have gone to intern there and even work there. So uh, next up, last but not least, is Dr. Sophilia Malachi, and she works for the USDA along with one of our professors, Dr. Nesbitt, um, and she specializes in food processing and sensory quality research, and she's a lead research scientist there. Thank you for being here. And she's also won many large awards, but we didn't listen. <laughs> <it. laughs> I think you're muted, Dr. Malachi. <laughs> well, you missed a whole lot. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, thank you for, uh, Amanda, for giving me the opportunity to talk to your students. Um, uh, over the years, we've hosted uh, several of your students in this in our lab. And I'm going to, um, so up till now, actually, I was a little off on my timing. I thought I had some time for my um, uh, presentation. So let me get that up for you guys. You're I fine. like Don't to tell me. people that I actually have a broken space-time continuum, which is true. <laughs> so let's get my dog out of Okay. Sorry about that. I generally never have a problem with this. I know what it is. It's because I'm not used to, okay, show all windows. That's Oh, great, not that. Sorry, this is kind of a little bit embarrassing here, but my computer is doing some really weird stuff. <laughs> Switching my screens and... All right. We've all been here. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. And... um. I'm trying to swap my presentation window and, oh, there we go. It did it this time. So 
I was having trouble with that. Screen two. So let me know if you actually can see. It looks great. Oh, you do see it. Okay, good. <laughs> I had too many windows open. Oh my God, could I have like another 400 screens open here? All right, so I started my, um, I'll just go ahead and start with this. Um, Earth is going on. Okay. So, all right. So I started my, um, I, I just, I'm going to, I'm going back to way far in my past. Sorry, uh, again, about the delay people. Um, but I the, graduated from high school in a completely different country. Um, I graduated in uh, Iran and uh, my entire life, I didn't have a, not necessarily that I didn't have a choice. I was never really thought, I never thought it was any other option. I, from the time I was very young, I was told I was going to college. So I knew I was going to college. And so when I first, um, uh, when I reached the right age, I started school in University of Tennessee, which is a little small school, not very uh, unlike Delgado in the, um, in Tennessee, University of Tennessee at Martin, which is a small town and it was a small college town. And um, I wanted to go to medical school. Um, so I was told the best way to do that is to major in chemistry and biology. Chemistry might be more impressive, so major in that. And I honestly, I really didn't like chemistry that much. <laughs> when I started out, I wasn't, a, I wasn't um, that crazy about chemistry. I'm not really sure that was that crazy about biology either, but that's what was going to get me to med school. So I minored in biology and third year in my college, they actually introduced a course called biochemistry. And although um, I had no concept of what a DNA or a protein was or did besides just common knowledge that anybody else has, um, and back then it was a lot less <laughs> known by the common knowledge as it is today regarding DNA and proteins and so forth. But um, I learned about biochemistry and I literally fell in love. I It was a really hard, hard concept for me to grasp, but once I started understanding it, I mean, I studied and studied and tried to get it. I just, I felt like I was in love. So I decided to change courses, but while I was in college, I, yeah, so I volunteered in the, so I had some chemistry. I got my very first grant. It was like a hundred dollars, believe it or not, to um, look at the, mo mo set up the molecule of cholesterol and LDL and HDL for the, for college. But um, I volunteered in the laboratory of our professor, the first biochemistry course um, or courses in our school who taught the first um, biochemistry courses. And mm, I studied something to do with heme metabolism and tadpoles. I can't even tell you what that detail was, but um, I basically went through college through using Pell Grants because my parents were in Iran in the middle of a war and I was here in the US by myself. Well, I had a sister and brother, but we were all pretty poor. So <laughs> we all went to school through with Pell Grants. And um, so when I graduated, I went to uh, graduate school. So I just remember last time I had to give, I gave this, not the had to, but I gave this talk, I kind of went over. So I'm trying to uh, make this a little shorter version of my life story. But I went to University of Arkansas for medical school. I applied um, for, but I didn't go to the medical sciences. I applied to the graduate school for biochemistry and I was able to get in and um, I, my PhD project, the long term was to understand um, basically gene regulation 
the signals and the cues that external environments would give to cells and how the cell interpreted that. So for example, if you're exposed to a hormone, there's effects in your body. How does that happen? So you look at the external um, uh, signals and how they affect the proteins that are within the nucleus that change how you uh, transcribe your DNA molecules and then which is then translated into proteins expressed and um, uh, causes the effects that you see from external stimuli. So I studied basically transcription factors um, that are involved in muscle development. So if you actually took these in nuclear proteins that are transcription factors that bind to DNA and regulate gene expression. So if you take these from muscle, the myOD family, um, and you put them into any other cell, those transcription factors will change that cell. Like if you put it in a fibroblast cell or you know skin cell or a fat cell, it will change those cells into muscle. So they were really um, in, uh, you know, important to study and it was really interesting, but nobody really knew about their interactions. So I spent, look, I looked at dimerization of these different transcription factors, the muscle specific transcription factors and how they bound to DNA. And um, the, so we cloned and expressed the proteins um, the transcription factors themselves. We determined equilibrium binding constants um, among the transcription factors because they dimerized and bound to each other. And also the same thing of those dimers binding, as you can see, there's a two dimers binding to the DNA. And so to summarize it, this is five years of my life in one page for everybody. <laughs> we had her, we, <laughs> I can't, I just, it, to me, when I look back on it, I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe that took like five years to get there. But um, we determined the thermodynamic equilibrium of all these. And the most interesting part was that these dimerizations were DNA facilitated. In other words, they really didn't dimerize very well, these transcription factors, unless there was DNA present and available for them to bind to. So from that, I ended up from this thesis, I ended up getting like three papers and I published my thesis. Um, so I went on and I didn't know what I was going to do. And I, um, one of my best friends was allergic to nuts. She was allergic to peanuts, tree nuts, legumes, all of them, everything. And um, there was a group in our department that had just, or in that area, uh, that had started looking at peanut allergens. Um, and at that time, that wasn't very prevalent. You couldn't, you didn't see very much of it or hear of it. And in the last decade, or sorry, in the last 20 years, peanut allergy ha has tripled and other food allergies as well. So we don't really know the reason for this increase. But as a young graduate student that was looking for a postdoc, I didn't really know where I was going to go. And I had at that time um, developed a serious relationship. I didn't want to leave the state. So I um, applied for a postdoctoral fellow to this new allergy lab and I got hired. And my job was to characterize the allergens and understand the immune system interaction with them. So in my graduate studies, I learned how to purify proteins. And I also understood how to study interaction of proteins. So antibodies and allergens is, were, are proteins. So I applied that expertise to study um, these, characterize the allergens and try to understand the immune system interaction. Um, and this is my friend, Dorothy, who is severely peanut allergic. And I'm literally like taking blood from her. I mean, there was a day and time where they didn't like come down with you with Lucifer's hammer or doing something like that. But at this in this day and age, it's like horrifying to think that you would take a, you know, a subject and put them in your lab and just take their blood, even though they are one of your best friends. So <laughs> um and we, you know, so I would take blood from her monthly. So then um I was showing doing a poster presentation at a, a meeting and a scientist from the US Department of Agriculture saw my poster 
and he said that they were looking for somebody that was doing food allergy because they were studying the effects of food processing on allergenicity. And, you know, my bosses at the time, my postdoctoral bosses and, you know, in the field in general, didn't think processing had any effect on food allergy at all. Um, or if it did, it was minor. So I almost like scoffed at it. But then I came for an interview, they offered me a job, and I decided to take it. Um, and then this was in New Orleans, which is why I'm here now. I'm the U I'm at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, pretty much down the street from you guys or up the street, whichever way you want to look at it. <laughs> and um, uh, we have had nice relationships with University of New Orleans, with Delgado, with Xavier, Tulane, and all the universities around us. Um, so I started the project, the effects of food processing on allergenicity of peanuts. Um, somewhere in, after I moved, this was like in 2001, this in 2005, I like showing this picture for people that are in New Orleans and weren't here during the hurricane, but um, uh, this, uh, the Katrina happened and we all got, I, I graduated from University of Arkansas Medical Sciences, if you remember that. So I ended up back at University of Arkansas Medical Sciences in the food, aller, in the allergy immunology lab that I was in before. And so these are the trailers they set up in the back of our building. There's like 50, 60 trailers. We, the employees lived in trailers because their houses, a lot of places were flooded. They couldn't even put a trailer. This is just the USDA, the back of the building. This here, my favorite picture is the entrance to the USDA. This is the sign to entering that. So you weren't here. That was a pretty uh, crazy time, but I used that time to, uh, I was displaced for almost two years, year and a half, and I used that time to edit a food allergy book uh, when I was in Arkansas. And I also worked, I actually had a student come, student or two come to Arkansas to do some work with me there. So the questions were, can processing change the allergenic properties of peanut uh, proteins? And of course, later other nuts or other foods. And we were the first lab to show that yes, it definitely can. If you roast a peanut, it does chemical modifications. That's these little stars. So if this is a food that you, you eat and it goes into your bloodstream, those little stars are chemical modifications that happen during roasting or processing or storage. And these um, green and red Ys are the antibodies that are produced by B cells that will bind to these uh, allergens or fragments of proteins. So normally, if you have a food allergy, I mean, if you don't have a food allergy, you eat a food and your immune system or IgG molecules will come and they'll survey your blood survey the food and go, oh yeah, we know, this is food, no problem, let's move on. But for some reason in allergic individuals, they make elevated levels of an antibody called IgE, and that it mediates the symptoms of allergic disease. So a lot of our studies involve looking at blood from allergic individuals, serum from allergic individuals, comparing their cell, cellular and antibody profiles and how they interact with allergic foods, now, you know, compared to somebody that's not allergic or allergic and so forth. So we do a lot of comparisons and try to understand the differences in these interactions. And um, so for the past 20 years, let, this is just a part of it. Actually, I have more than one page than I had for the five-year one when I graduated, <laughs> but I'm only going to show this because I don't want to go over time as I did before too much. But um, we've studied the interaction of the allergens. So this is, if you look at these blue circles, they're individual allergens. We, look, we know that they oligomerize. We know if, they, if you pro roast them, that um, these sugar modifications, it's like a caramelization. They modify the surface of the proteins and they cause cross-linking to where like a trimeric molecule, like this triangle, that was originally can come apart and go back together again. When you roast it, they become chemically cross-linked at these places where they hold hands and they are no longer, it's an irreversible trimer. We know that um, the IgE binding sites happen to be located at the place where these are ha these molecules hold hands. So 
no, I'm not going to go into details, but we also can identify where the chemical modifications occur on the surface of the allergen on the front and the back and so forth. And then so and then where the antibodies bind, this is a different one where the IgEs or IgG4 is bind. So these are the type of studies we do is very basic, basic, but maybe translational. And I'll move into that. So we took the basic sciences and this understanding by then I'd published like about 45 papers on the effects of processing on allergenic properties of uh, allergens and foods and peanut in particular. And so um, how did this basic science turn into a seriously applied science in that a company approached us, they had a, they were a startup company. They wanted to develop an oral immunotherapy for peanut allergy. So you know how when you take, um, increasing doses of uh, shots for allergy, inhaled allergens, you go and you get a shot. So for the peanut, they thought, okay, if we give them ingest, uh, ingested version, uh, an oral version of increasing doses, will, can we desensitize people? Well, the research had come out that that can happen. And so this company was a startup company. They had $20 million in funds and startup company. They came to us and said, can you help us characterize a peanut, basically peanut flour, roasted peanut flour, peanut. So we actually characterized peanut to death. Um, it was the very first food that has ever been characterized as a pharmaceutical because it was actually registered. Peanut flour was registered as a investigational new drug and approved by the FDA. And it's the very first FDA approved treatment for food allergy. Up till now, there has never been any treatment for food allergy. The only treatment is, or the option has been and is avoidance other than this, even to this day. So this product was called Palforzia and it was marketed. And um, as it was approved and started to be marketed, the company that started with $20 million was purchased by Nestle Health Sciences for $2 billion. So we participated in this and um, Chapeau and I just went to my support scientist that probably did all the work. Um, um, and so other people participated, of course. Um, we just accepted an award for technology transfer for that product in last week. and. So then the coronavirus happened. Before the coronavirus, we had a bunch of students in our lab. Um, and so that, and again, that's one aspect of our studies and we've changed them. I'll give you a brief summary, but this is the end. But so we have students from UNO, like Justin, I think he went on to medical school. Christina went to work with Thermo Fisher. Achira works with Eurofins. Um, uh, I think... Many of you may recognize Dr. Nesbitt, but she's always been off and on, and she was also involved in the Palforzia studies. Um, and um, Stephen is a technician uh, now at the center with a permanent USDA position, and Jane was a UNO student, went on to um, Texas and did some work there and came back, and she's a support scientist here. Um, so now we're working on understanding same thing, immunological reactivity and cross-reactivity among food allergens. So we look at antibody binding to the allergens, linear, conformational, or folded parts or linear parts of the proteins. And we identify these linear parts that are bound by the antibodies. We can look at them on the structure of the allergens as shown here. So for example, these three are the same homologs or similar allergens from peanut, cashew, and walnut. And if you look at it just visually, you can't tell the difference. So we're trying to tell the difference because somebody can have Ig against all three of these nuts, but only react to two or one or none. And so we're trying to understand how that's possible. And so we, we're generating massive amounts of data where we put a whole bunch of peptides on a chip and we look at the antibody binding by various patients, zero with known characteristics. And we can identify where these antibodies bind based on where the fluorescence lights up. And we can show where they are on the structure of the protein. And the bottom line, we're working on developing definitive diagnostics. This is what the chips would look like. 
And then like the red antibodies, IgG4, which is a blocking antibody. This is the binding pattern. The green would be two. And then the yellow is the different fragments of allergens that we generate on these chips. And so thank you for listening to my talk. I hope it gave you some information. Again, that the path is not a straight path going from muscle development to food allergy to developing a, you know, a drug that goes into market. I never thought I would be working with the pharmaceutical industry, but also we, you know, we have everybody from like Scott here was a fellow at, and I have many fellows that are specializing in allergy come and do research in the lab. So we have fellows to foreign nationals, like my PhD student from Spain. Again, um, these, the, these two were high school students that came and worked in the lab. We have UNO, um, Delgado, and you know other countries that people come and do. This is a here's a face that you might recognize from Delgado, and he's um, he actually joined my lab last year in February. He is now working for the um, Louisiana Tumor Registry. We found him that job. Actually, Chapeau found him that job through a connection, and this is Zainab who graduated from Delgado, and she is currently working as a technician in the lab below me. And I just found out yesterday that, um, and she's actually a company's paying her salary to work in Jillian's lab downstairs. So this is a temporary type position, but uh, I just heard that Jillian's looking for a permanent technician position. And she has asked Zainab to please apply for that position because she would like to keep her. I don't blame her. So Delgado puts out quality students that really want to work hard. And we, um, you know, we love working with all of you. We can't necessarily pay you right off the bat. You come in with the, not just me, but other scientists in the group. We can help you look for them. Dr. Nesbitt's really uh, helpful in that. One, I love having the students. Um, because I, I got to push somebody around. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I I love teaching on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I'm not one of the, uh, you know, the fact, but, uh, you know, coming in the lab and starting a project and watching somebody develop and learn that is really exciting. And then to move on. And so we always try to help you find a job or push you, push you in the right direction. Now, Zainab is actually going to, she uh, started, school in um, bachelor her bachelor's at UNO right now and so she's got multiple options she can move on to go to master's and PhD she can take this technician's position she can lots of lots of options and same for Gregory he's right now part of the tumor registry but there's a lot of upward motion and the beauty of it is once he gets really good at his job he can actually work remotely he can actually go and hang out and you know some island and <laughs> still be able to do his job. So, you know, for every one of you, there's all kinds of wonderful opportunities. These talks before me, just, I, I just, I want to work with all of them. Um, uh, really exciting. So anyway, thanks for your time. Thanks for inviting me. I hope I didn't go too much over time. Um, cause I no, actually perfect. And again, I say this a lot, but to everyone on the um, meeting and that might listen in the future, you have been such a integral part of the program success, supporting our students, giving them opportunities, um, donating materials, allowing our students to tour, come work with um, higher level laboratory materials than we are able to provide them. So. Our success is partially because of your support. So we cannot thank you enough. Thank you. So we truly appreciate it. And I do want to mention overall that I've been texting and chatting with quite a few of our faculty members, and they are always impressed with how relatable all of you are with being so successful in your careers. And that makes it much easier for students to be um, approaching and networking and getting their foot in the door and just learning more about what opportunities are out there. So thank you so much on behalf of myself and the entire crew. 
And again, a shout out to Dr. Nisbet for connecting us with you many years ago. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, same, same here. I think it's a symbiotic relationship. So we can. Uh, Biology term. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Had to throw that in there. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions or comments? I did get a few messages from students that they're really excited to um, learn some more about the USDA. Oh, absolutely. And the beauty of it is we're right down the street too. And there's a, you know, this is just one science. There's a lot of people that do ex really exciting research here. I mean, we're a historical site for cotton research and our, um, there, are, we, our center developed, um, uh, um, permanent press cotton, um, fire retardant cotton, uh, wound healing cotton now that's actually being um, in contract with uh, talking to DOD for developing for soldiers in the field. Um, uh, super absorbent cotton for incontinence and other, uh, other purposes, but the wound healing one's really excited because it starts to, for if you can't get to a medic, at least it can stop the bleeding in the battlefield, for example, or in other emergencies. So there's all kinds of really exciting research that I didn't talk about. I just talked about myself. <laughs> so, um, you know, so there's a lot of opportunities. Well, thank you very much. And we appreciate your time. And that actually concludes uh, the presenters. And um, I just want to emphasize that in the chat, I have put the link to today's presentation by Delgado, not necessarily the presenters, and that link will provide you with information on faculty and some of our graduates and where they are now. Not all of our graduates are on here. We just grabbed a handful of them just so you can see some of their experiences. But you also heard um, other individuals talk about their relationships with some of our graduates and where they have come and where they have gone. Um, most importantly, and I'm sorry, I'm running through this backwards really quickly. I just want to um, re-emphasize the uh, contact information and our social media presence. Uh, the social media presence is thanks to um, Ms. Shunick. And then any of these emails, that you're comfortable contacting, you can gain information from all of us and we can provide you with career paths, academic uh, paths, just information um, about the programs as well as put you in contact with potential employers once you're in the programs. So if anyone has any other questions or can comments, let us know. This um, will be available on all of the social media outlets, um, and we'll probably post it on Canvas as well for students to access, but it will take us a few um, days, maybe a week or so to process and make sure it's accessible and loaded properly. Um, Ms. Shunick, Dr. Noble, any lasting words? I was just gonna say, um... I love these open houses because I hope that it shows students that the path you are on right now may not be the path that you take forever, but when you have skill sets and you know are familiar with different fields of science, so many different doors open for you. And that's one of the things our program is really best at, training you guys with a diverse set of skill sets. So, you know, keep your eyes open and, and ears open to different opportunities. And if there's an internship or something that seems exciting to you, go for it. I mean, we'll support you through it. So, you know, keep that in the back of your head. There's always gonna be little opportunities that present themselves to you um, when you get, you know, appropriate skills. I just wanna say thank you to everybody for attending and all of the presentations from our guests. Like they were very informative. Again, just like Ms. Shunick said, they gave the students an idea of not going a direct path. Like we may circle around, we may go straight there, we may dibble and dabble in different fields. So thank you guys so much. And please do not hesitate to reach out to any of us through 
Dr. Nobles, my, my own email are Ms. Shunix, or if you're more comfortable reaching out to the other emails, that's fine too. We all work together and we're all here to support your successes. Thank you everybody. And I hope to hear from you soon.